Morning. Morning. Palm Sunday. According to the Gregorian calendar, anyway. Certainly not according to the Jewish calendar, but we'll, we'll go with the Gregorian since we use it every day anyway. So. We'll open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can be gathered to him, to know him as our great Savior, to know him as the head of the church, to know him as Lord, to know him as the soon coming King of Kings. And as we gather now and open your word, we're trusting as you promised that your spirit would open our hearts and our minds to the details that you've given us that will help us to grow in our faith and our love for him and our desire to follow after him with our whole heart. Both here and in the Sunday school, we're praying that your word would be penetrating into our hearts bring eternal glory and honor to your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So who can tell me one detail about Palm Sunday? Just one. You know what Palm Sunday is, right? I mean, we don't necessarily always celebrate it, but, but a lot of Christians do. Who knows? One, de one detail. Tom. Yeah, exactly, the fulfillment of Zechariah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Spontaneous crowd, right? They just saw him and, you know, another detail. I'm sorry? Jesus was riding on a donkey. One on which one never had, no one had ever rode before. And it wasn't his, if you consider the fact that he was a visitor on this planet. What else? It was our weekly CIT passage in 2008. <laughs> it was what? It was our weekly CIT passage back in 2008. Should I give him a pop quiz? I'm sure he'll do fine. He will not forget those truths. The details of what we call Palm Sunday are very familiar. And there are some details that are more familiar than others. Some seem less important. Some are ignored altogether. But we got the concept that Christ was coming into Jerusalem and he was fulfilling the promise <coughs> given to us through the prophet Zechariah. And there was a lot of crowd. There was a lot of crowd. There were a lot of people. And in that crowd, there are various types of people. And that crowd made up people for different reasons. And so I have found in my own study of the scriptures, the details that most people, including myself, tend to not pay attention to are the details that, in fact, become the most challenging. Because at times it seems those details are deliberately ignored or deliberately not applied. And we believe in a Bible that God has described as, especially the Gospels, Jesus Christ did many things while he was here that are not written in the book. But these details are written in the book so that you would believe. 
And in believing, you would have life in his name. Life in his name. Not just eternal life. Not just think about the future. Christianity following Christ is not just the future. If in the next life only, and I know I'm twisting the verse, I'm doing it deliberately, a great verse of 1 Corinthians 15 where it says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. As Paul would go and force the understanding of the need to believe in Christ's bodily resurrection. And I'm in Bible school in England, I learned the opposite side of it. If in the next life only we have hope in Christ, while we're living on earth, we're most miserable. If all we can do is think about heaven, and I do a lot, and the older I get, the more I do, okay? Closer to the grave, as they say, the more you think about the future in heaven once you leave the planet, and you're going to leave the planet. I know I've told you that before. You're going to leave the planet. You're going to live forever when you do leave the planet. Not just Christians live forever. Christians live forever in the presence of God because of the work that Christ did. Those who refuse Christ do not live there. Do not live there with God. They live elsewhere. And I needn't tell you where that place would be or try to describe it. However, I would say this. If I could scare you into heaven because you don't want to go to eternal judgment, eternal suffering, if I could show you that and that would scare you to turn to Christ, to avoid that, I would do it. That's a great place to start. Just don't go there because you will unless Christ saves you. You won't go there because you try to go there. You'll go there because you're a member of Adam's fallen race. And Christ has said, you don't have to go there. You don't have to go there. You're going to leave. You're going to last forever. We're all equally eternal. Eternal judgment and damnation and suffering compared to eternal life with Jesus Christ. Yes, that's the offer. It seems absolutely ridiculous that people would refuse it. And maybe the closer they get to eternity, they will. They'll find themselves crying out to the Lord to be saved. We don't know. Well, that's the good news. That's the glorious gospel. But if only in that life we have hope that Christ is powerful, as we heard this morning, then while we live here, we're miserable. And I know a lot of miserable Christians, <laughs> believe me. And there are times when I get miserable. And I just, at my age, I refuse to be discouraged or miserable anymore. I'm just not going to be. Christ is just too much. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Christ is just too much fun. Right? Following Christ is just too exciting right? because of what he has. It's the details of Palm Sunday that we don't talk about that I want to bring you five details. Five details that are, to me, indication that on this glorious day, it's an event. It's a once-in-a-life event in the history of the planet. There was one day when Jesus Christ rode a foal or a baby donkey, however you want to describe it, into Jerusalem. It was like his birth. There was one day when he was born. In his death, there was one day when he was crucified. And that day he was also buried. In his resurrection, there was one day when he rose. These are all days that we celebrate. And we should. We should celebrate. Because of what Christ was doing. Palm Sunday is a day when God was doing something very special through his son, Jesus Christ, that brought about a response from a crowd of people, a crowd made up of different types of people, okay? And I want to look at five details that are very convicting to me. They're not just because I don't always apply them, but because when I do apply them, I don't 
necessarily feel comfortable about them, and yet, nevertheless, they are true. Not every truth is meant to be comforting. Some truth, believe it or not, is meant to be exposing, cutting into us the sharpness of the word of God that shows us perhaps our intentions and our motives aren't good or aren't genuine. So let me show you five details starting in John's gospel. And if will start with the greatest detail, what God is doing on this day. We lose sight of what God's doing. You know, we're all caught up right now perhaps as a nation with what candidates are doing or what Ukraine is doing or what Israel is doing. Sorry to say, if that's all the farther you can see, then no wonder that you know you you might find your your day not as joyful as normal. But what is God doing on this day? What did God do? And to do that, I think we have to put a time element in, a time. So, starting in verse one of John twelve, we read these words: six days. Before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. That's all we stop right there. I don't want to go no farther. I don't want to talk about Lazarus necessarily. I want to put a time element in your thinking. Six days before Passover. All right? A Passover, the lamb had to be slaughtered on the 14th day of the Jewish month called Nisan. The Feast of Unleavened Bread started that night, the 15th. Jesus came to Bethany six days before the 15th, which makes it Nisan number nine, the ninth of Nisan. That's a calendar day. When Jesus Christ actually did this, we can figure out exactly what day of the week that was based on the Jewish calendar. So we know that six days before, before the Passover feast started, which was the day after the Passover slaughter, came Jesus to Bethany. That's the ninth of Nisan. And you don't have to remember these facts, of course. These are just things that interest me. Verse 12 of this chapter. The next day. The next day. Right? That's the 10th. Why is that important? Well, because according to the teaching of the Old Testament, the 10th was a day when all Jewish families were meant to go out and pick out their lamb, their Passover lamb. And they were going to bring it home on the 10th, according to Exodus and Leviticus, and they're going to tie their lamb, most of them tied the lamb up close to the front door of their house or their tent so that every time they went in and out, they saw the lamb to remind them that on the 14th, they were going to slaughter this lamb. All right? Now, this didn't happen in Exodus on the day of the original Passover, but the celebration of the Passover, which was a yearly feast. So on the 10th, you were supposed to go and pick out the lamb for your family. And if your family was so small, you're supposed to join with your neighbors. So there would be 10 or more men who would be part of this feast that you're hosting with the lamb that you picked out and you brought home. You went shopping for it, more or less, on the 10th. And you indicated to all your neighbors, my intention is to celebrate the Passover, on the 10th, when... Jesus, in verse 12, therefore goes and leaves Bethany. It's on the 10th. It's on the 10th of Nisan. It's on the first day of that particular week when the 14th is going to be on a Thursday. All right? So we see Christ coming into Jerusalem at a time when it's appointed for all Jews to have a lamb picked out that they're going to sacrifice. And I suggest to you, as great men of God in the past have, 
that on this day, God showed his people the lamb he picked out by sending his son into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, yes, of course, there's the fulfillment of Zechariah. That we know. But God's intention was to make it clear. This is the lamb that I've chosen. All right? This is the lamb. Please. I know I don't like to split hairs. Sometimes. Sometimes I do. The Passover lamb is not the scapegoat. The scapegoat was on the day of Yom Kippur. That's a fall. It wasn't a festival. It was an event. It's represented in the New Testament and teaching in the book of Hebrews and John's epistle where Christ is shown as a propitiation for our sins, the blood on the mercy seat. That's not the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb was an intention of God to demonstrate his power to redeem his people out of Egypt by the death of the firstborn. But whoever had blood on their door, he passed over. He would not let any death in the house of those he passed over. It's a display of his mercy, his grace, his desire not to put people in the lake of fire, but to bring people unto himself. Passover is not the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world as John the Baptist proclaimed. That picture of Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is a different picture. It's still true, but not the Passover truth. Christ is, or God is trying to show the nation of Israel who have, in that particular day, were living under Roman judgment, that he's merciful. He would prefer to be merciful to people rather than to judge them and put them in the lake. All right. And so here he is. I'm going to send my son by design on the tenth into Jerusalem, riding on the foal. When they see him, they're going to get excited for different reasons. But this is my presentation of my son. That's what God was doing. That's what God was doing. And why is that convicting to me? Number one. I think that sometimes we get caught up in thinking that we are the ones who are sh showing Christ to people. And we are. We are. There's no doubt about it. But it was the work of Almighty God to send him into the Son. He prepared a body for him to live in. And now he, Christ lived a life of complete obedience to his Father. And now comes a time when he's drawing near to the week in which he's going to be crucified. And here on the 10th of Nisan... God says to his son, let's go. Ride the donkey. It's time to go. You should present yourself. And the people got it for the most part. They got it. They, they realized what was going on. So you see it, next phrase of verse 12 of John 12. A great crowd. The great crowd that had come from the festival. For the festival. Heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. All right. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. Now, they're in the city. They had come for Passover. And they were shouting, Hosanna, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it's written, don't be afraid, daughter Zion. Your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. And at first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now in that crowd with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, you know, from John 11, continued to spread the word. And many people, because they heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. All right, so we have to back up and ask a hard question. In verse 12, it says, a great crowd that had come for the festival. 
just flip one half chapter back to the 11th chapter of John. And starting at verse 55, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus, saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? Is he coming to the feast at all? Is he coming or not? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so they might arrest him. So this is the hard question. Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem early? Passover started on the 14th, and the dinner was on the 15th. Why was he going on the 10th? Well, I said already that God wanted to show his lamb, his choice. There were Jews there from the country, right? Jews that went out, many went up from the country to purify themselves. Why? The answer in the law is that because those who lived at a distance from Jerusalem didn't go daily for the cleansing of their sin. It was too far away. They showed up occasionally. And of the three great festivals, they would go early to satisfy the law that required so many days of cleansing for their particular sins that they were guilty of in order that they could eat the Passover undefiled. So they went up early to cleanse themselves, to purify themselves ceremonially. All right? That's why they were there. Is that why Jesus went early? No. Not at all. He was sinless. He would never need to purify himself. He went up at the command of God to show so that God, his father, could show the choice of lamb for Passover on the 10th as the law requires. All these other from a distant living Jews who wanted to be ready for Passover, they had to go up a week early. Some was a week early. And so Jerusalem started having festival goers early. All right? And there they are. The crowd. Going back to John 12 for a second. The crowd that came for the festival early, they heard that Jesus was coming. All right? Now just think about that for a second. Why? That's convicting to me. <clears throat> How many Christians really don't start thinking about Christ till walking in that door on Sunday morning? I mean, you use breaking a bread for a confessional. I'm going to go sit there in silence and just remember that of all my mistakes for the past week. And I'm going to pray and ask for forgiveness and, and trust that God will get me ready because I need to be worthy to eat because it says don't eat and drink unworthily. And we've turned breaking a bread for many Christians who've come out of the Roman way into a confessional. Come here and sit in silence and just think about, well, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Stop right there. The minute you're not thinking about Christ while you're here for his supper, you're not obeying. You're just not obeying. He said, think about me. You're thinking about you? Not only thinking about yourself, thinking about what about you? All oh, my mistakes, because i got to confess them. And I only do it once a week. And that's how this was. These people went up maybe three times a year who lived farther than 10, 15 miles because it was inconvenient to keep a close, short account with the Lord. Yeah, just add those up because I'll go up a week before Passover and I'll get them all and I'll pay the extra money and I'll get special sacrifices and offer them up. So on Passover meal night, I'll be clean. That's how a lot of Christians are. I get like that. I'll deal with that later. I don't need to deal with that right now. I can deal with that later. You know, and so here's a crowd of people coming out now who are there celebrating, but they're not really celebrating yet. They're preparing themselves. They went up early to purify themselves. And that, beloved brothers and sisters, please believe me, 
That hampers and hinders true worship. True worship. All right? True worship. God's looking for true worship. Not true worship. He's looking for true worshipers. He's looking for individuals who are genuinely engaged and not thinking about themselves and their sin, but thinking about the wonder of his son as we heard this morning. The declaration of one who would come in the flesh and dwell among us for the purpose of taking your sin away. Jesus Christ. That's who we're thinking about. Then we show the Lord's Supper. Did you ever hear the word crowdfunding? Crowdsourcing? You know what it is? Familiar with it? <laughs> Was the nation of Israel the first people who practiced crowdfunding? When they left Egypt that night, Everybody asked their neighbor for a little bit. And God convicted the Egyptians to give everybody leaving a little of their possessions, their gold, their rubies. And they, Exodus 12 says, and then they went out fully laden with all the stuff that God. And so the church has become what? And what's the real concept of crowdfunding? Everybody give a little. Everybody just give a little. If everybody gave a little, we'd end up with a lot. The more people we have, the more we get because everybody gives a little. That's the concept. hate to tell you. You go on Facebook, somebody recently needs an emergency fund for a burial or something, and they just want a little. Just give us a dollar. But if I get enough people to give me a dollar, yeah, that's not worship. The crowd, the more the better. No. No. God's looking for true worshipers. He's looking for hearts engaged. All right? Not hearts who have come in occupied with themselves because they know they've been miserable all week and haven't loved the Lord, showed love, or followed him in any way. They just haven't. All right? Yeah, I'm not going to finish five, pe five details. We'll blame Clint. <clears throat> Too much singing. Only teaser. Julia, so John came here. Yeah, that's Chinese. Anyway, I want to get to verse 19 to consider the second detail. The Pharisees said one to another, this is getting us nowhere. Look. The whole world has gone after him. Now, you know who the Pharisees are, right? Yeah, you know. You know where they came from, right? Most Jewish scholars would tell you that they came from Ezra. In the book of Ezra, in the book of Daniel, when they're rededicating Jerusalem in the temple and the wall, there were so many men who signed their name on an oath to live separate and not to intermarry. And those people lived separate lives. And that word separate continued to grow until you had this whole group of people who then, by Christ's time, called themselves or didn't actually call themselves. They allowed others to call them as the separatists, the Pharisees. And they were, as Christ, we think of them as legalists, and, and that's all right. Christ was the keeper of the law. The Pharisees thought they were as well. But when Christ warned his disciples about the Pharisees, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. That's the danger of Phariseeism, to create hypocrisy in us. Hypocrisy, you know, the ability to present a smiling face, and behind the curtain there's anger and there's meanness and there's rottenness to present ourselves holy when we live unholy, to present ourselves happy when we're not happy. We have this innate ability as human beings to pretend we're one thing when we're not. And in Christianity, it's deadly. It's deadly. The ability me, you, every one of us have to show one thing and be the opposite. Right? The Pharisees were in this great crowd 
That was crowdsourcing. Everybody was saying something, adding their voice to the singing. And the Pharisees were there. And the Pharisees said to each other, now a conversation between Pharisees, maybe not as loud as the singing. This is getting us nowhere. You, see, you sense their level of frustration. We're not getting anything done. We're going nowhere. You remember at John 11, after he rose Lazarus from the dead, they were fearful. And they said, if we let this man continue, the Romans are going to come. Everybody's going to believe in him, and the Romans are going to come. And they're going to take away our temple and our nation. That selfish attitude, that, like, that temple didn't belong to Pharisees. It was God's temple. It was God's temple. But the ability for hypocrites to think that it's yours. And now you're anxious and fearful that Christ has more followers than you? When the message of John the Baptist was simple. He must increase. I must decrease. And any disciple of Christ knows that. If you're not helping Christ increase, and you decreasing, what are you doing? Helping yourself increase. Diotrephes, remember him from the New Testament? He increased. He wanted all the attention. He wanted the center of attention. He wanted preeminence. Christ and Christ only preeminence. He must increase, not he maybe will. He must increase, and I must decrease. And the Pharisees always want to be, hypocrites always want to be the center of attention. The whole world's gone after him. Well, yeah, he's Jesus Christ. He's Jesus Christ. That's what we want. We want the whole world to go after him. We don't want him to come after us. We don't want to make disciples after ourselves. We're not looking for followers. We're looking to make disciples of all men. That's the task he gave us. And it was the Pharisees, as recorded in Luke, and I'm not asking you to turn there, who said, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, in the 19th chapter of Luke, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And the Pharisees said to Christ, tell your disciples to be quiet. Rebuke them. Correct them. They shouldn't be saying that stuff. Imagine being happy about Jesus. Being full of praise. The hypocrite says, silence them. And Jesus, his response is well known. I can tell them to be quiet. If they do, the rocks will take their place. If I tell them to be quiet, the rocks that I'm standing on will sing out instead. You have your preference. Some rocks probably sing better than some Christians, I can tell you that. Not you, though. I'm not talking about you. But that's, that's the issue of, of hypocrisy. Silence those who would be cheerful. Quickly, then. Quickly, moving quickly. Turn over to Matthew real quick. It says I have four minutes. My watch says no minutes. And you're actually going to get ten minutes. Fasten your seatbelt. I'll be done quick. Matthew 21 then. And I just want to include two more details. I won't do five. I'll do four. This is the second. We did the Pharisees. We did God. Now I want to consider the disciples. Out of Matthew's gospel, verse 1 of chapter 21, the simple plan, chapter verse 2, go to the village ahead of you. The village ahead of them at this time was roughly from the light, when you come off Mile Strip Road to turn down this main street out here, that light on Mile Strip when I get off I-90 to your door is the same distance. Same distance. It's between Bethany and Beth Page, Beth Page, right? I want you to go and get the colt, right? Verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And could you ever have a better testimony? They went and did what they were told to do. 
consider the possibility. You're looking for a donkey. You, he didn't say go ask questions till you find one. Go ask the neighbors if they have one. You walk until you see the one I want. You'll see it. You'll see it. Luke tells us they did and found it just like Christ had said. But when did we ever lose the concept that disciples follow instructions? Follow the instructions. Just do what Christ taught us to do. We don't have to be the church of what's happening now. We have to be a room full of disciples who follow instructions. That's all we need. And you'll find, as Christ has said, that's the promise. One more detail, and I shall stop. And it will be found in Luke 19. This is the most overlooked one. This is the one that will be most convicting for me. I can't say it will be convicting to you. I do not know. As he approached, verse 41, Jerusalem, and saw the city, he wept. He wailed. He wailed over it. And then he had several comments towards the city. Now, keep in mind, this is people singing hallelujah, hosanna, praise the Lord, hallelujah, hosanna, even the rocks are crowd. And while that's going on, Jesus is riding down the Mount of Olives, getting closer and closer to the city. And at some strategic point, he could look out and see the city, and he not wept like the word wept in Lazarus, outside of Lazarus' tomb, where it says the shortest verse in the Bible, and Jesus wept in which people said, look how much he loved Lazarus. He's weeping. They noticed this is wailing, loud, visible. He wept. First point of conviction for me. Did any of the other disciples know that? No other disciple included it. No other gospel writer included it. Luke, the Gentile writer. Luke, who wasn't even there. Luke, the investigator of all things, who waited on God for, tell me what happened to your son through Paul's gospel. Now, before you, I want to know what happened to your son. And here's God revealing to Luke that, yeah, he wept. He wept. Did anybody notice? Did anybody say, Lord Jesus, why are you crying? Did anybody care? It is so easy to get caught up in the emotion of what we're doing. We're having a blast. And not considering how Jesus Christ feels. Does he enjoy the meeting at Blaisdell? Not do I enjoy it. Do what I do in my singing bring tears to his eyes as he cries out, if you only knew, Doug, really, who I am. If you only knew. If you could get it in your head, you've got all this theology, you think you've got it all down, you understand. But if you only knew how I feel about all this, how I feel, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Lord. I haven't really been paying attention to you. I'm paying attention to everybody else in the crowd. I'm worried about how my wife feels. How my, I, I, Yeah, I'm worried about how I want to shepherd other. How do you feel, Lord Jesus? Oh, yeah, when I looked at him, he was weeping. Not one person could say that. <clears throat> when I looked close at the Lord, he was weeping. He wasn't having a good time. He was not enjoying it. The one who came to do the Father's will. Who said at his birth, a body have you prepared for me. I've, Lo, as it's written of me in the volume of the book, oh my God, I have come to do your will. Who said the same prayer in the garden that night when he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me three times, sweating as it were great drops of blood. And finally in each line said, not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. Jesus. Christ. And I will just ask one question, and I will close with this in the Revelation. 
He's also seen riding, but not on a donkey. He's on a great white horse. He has a vesture that's been dipped in blood. He has a name written on his side, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. And he's coming. I don't think many people are going to be singing then. And I will ask you, is that the Jesus Christ you follow? Is that the Jesus Christ that's your Savior? I trust that he is. And if he's not, today's a great day to say, Lord, save me. Save me. We'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> the details you've given us of your son. We thank you for him who endured such contrary behavior by his own creation to go to a cross to have you almighty God make him sin make him my sin so that I could be made in your eyes like your son we rejoice and we glad we give you thanks in his name Jesus Christ amen <clears throat>